So, hello everybody. A warm welcome from the Sugar Bar. For those of you who haven't been here at the Sugar Bar, we have this institution for roughly six months now. And uh, as you probably know from all kinds of business conferences, from sugar meetings and so on, one of the coolest places to hang out after you know having any kind of presentation is the bar. So this is why we decided to introduce this kind of virtual bar in the pandemic times. Um, in order to make me feel not so alone here, I would like to encourage you exactly to switch on your cameras if this is possible for you. So um, I can see some of the faces who are actually with me here at the virtual bar. We uh, so um, we um, we started this whole thing about uh, six months, almost six months ago, at the beginning of uh, uh, June, when we had the final presentations of the previous cycle, the sugar cycle, uh, which was not as usual in the U.S., but we, it was already in um, uh, early June. It was already online. So um, as I said, it's roughly half a year old. So we, uh, we start with a bit of chit chatting here and to give other people a chance to join. As you can see, there's more people showing up. So before we officially start with our guests that we have here in the call today, um, let's, uh, yeah, let's just have a bit of a, a, a loose conversation. So I see filling, yes. Who else do we have here? I see somebody from Brazil, from Germany. Yeah. Oh, I, I see someone who is a, a former alumni, an alumni from um, from a corporate part as a corporate partner. From Italy, we have someone as well. Do we have other nationalities here? Uh, Switzerland. <laughs> yes. Perfect. <laughs> and some more. I think I see some French, more Italian. Yes, from Italy. From last year, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yes, yes, I am. Cool. Oh, also wait. from two years ago, here. Awesome, from Brazil, right? No. Italy. Italy as well. Okay. I see at least two people from Sweden here. Yeah, I guess I can say that I represent Sweden a little bit. <laughs> Definitely Colombia. Yeah, I would say more of Colombia there. <laughs> well, <laughs> both, oh. let's say both. Oh, one of our alumni is already joining. Good to see him, good to see you, Benedict. Yeah, so um, let's get slowly started. Um, so I. I, I very briefly introduced you what's the background of the sugar bar. And uh, for those of you who have been here at the first iteration that we did after the expo, which was in September, if I recall correctly, October, um, I don't usually, I'm not alone in the sugar bar as a your sugar bartender. I have a fellow sugar bartender, so to speak. And my fellow sugar bartender today is Juan from the Linköping University. Hi, Juan. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Juan Ruiz. I guess uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I am a former student. I did my project 2008-2011 and I've been through a lot of the places of sugar that sugar offers. I've been a TA in Colombia. Uh, I also worked uh, in companies that were doing design thinking with the sugar network and now I am part of the teaching team here at Link Shopping University and you can see our beautiful loft in the background. <laughs> Thank you, and I'm looking forward to jointly facilitating the session today with you, Juan. And um, before we get yeah, started, be before we get started, some technicalities. You already discovered the chat box, as I can see. Um, so feel feel free to use the chat box in your lower left uh, corner. I guess no, right corner. And um, also, you can. This is something that we introduced, I think, in for the expo this year. We can heavily make you heavily use of emojis. So uh, you can just use your emojis to uh, signal an applause, uh, whatever, you know, um, passion, anything that you can do as an emotion that you want to uh, signal to us. You now, someone dancing or so, feel free to use the chat box. 
Also in the chat box, if you have any questions to our um, interview guests today, and we're going to introduce you to the interview guests in a few um, minutes. Um, if you have any questions, please also put your um, questions in the chat box. Uh, we will have the interview between, let's say, the guests, Juan and I, for roughly 30, 40 minutes on uh, some, we prepared something. But uh, if there are any questions that fit into one of our slots, we will also pick them from the, um, the communication, from the chat box, from the communications. And uh, also, after now we have, uh, let's say, our intro part, we will give you the opportunity just to unmute yourself and uh, speak to our guests directly. So we have a bit more of an interaction. Um, but first, uh, we get started with uh, you know, opening the floor from, a, from the bar perspective, right? Uh, yeah, also, I can see the, the use of the clapping sign. This, is a, this got really uh, popular over the last couple of months. So with this, I would like to uh, get started now. And uh, Juan, do you want to introduce our very first guest? Yes, of course. So the, our very first case, uh, I had the pleasure of teaching her uh, back in the day when I was in Javeriana. Uh, she's Juliana Negrete. Uh, she did her project uh, in 2014, 2015 for Javeriana University. So welcome. Hi, Juliana. guys. Very excited to be here and reconnected. I'm right now in London. Um, so let's get started. Cool. Our second guest is uh, from across the ocean. Um, it's Bernardo Bichuscher, and he is from Sao Paulo in Brazil. And he was a sugar member uh, probably four, five, six years ago, quite a while actually. Hi, everyone. Glad to be here also. Um, my sugar project was 15, 16, so four, more or less five, four years ago exactly. Uh, I'm currently living in Sao Paulo, but currently in Fortaleza, which is my hometown, spending some time with parents since the pandemic. So, yeah, nice to be here. Yep. And last but definitely not least, uh, we have Felix, Felix Market. Uh, he did his project in 2013-2014 and uh, from Paris D School. Uh, welcome, Felix. Hello, hello everyone. Um, same, very excited to be here, and especially since I've been quite passionate about uh, like pandemic reaction in a creative and or positive way to collaborate online, etc. And so I think this initiative is uh, is very great. So thank you for inviting me. And um, then there's another person which is important uh, throughout the whole conversation. You already met her. Uh, she already spoke up. That's Maya, our current uh, managing director of the Sugar Network. Hi, Maya. Hi. Yeah. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you to our moderators, our panelists, and especially all the audience, because without you, it would be really lonely here. So, um, yeah, I'm excited. I know there's so many out there now, conferences virtual, but I think it's also an enablement to actually reconnect. And I think there's a lot of potential and this is just the beginning. <laughs> okay, and now it's time to get started. Um, what you may have recognized, uh, and I want to point this out, we are recording this session mainly for the reason to cut out uh, you know, bits and pieces, uh, snippets that we can reuse either as audio, or as audio video whatsoever. So if you feel totally uncomfortable, you would probably switch off your camera, but we would appreciate if we can see as many of your faces as possible, because it just creates a cool atmosphere. And with this, let's get started. Um, so our guests, I mean, what we already heard is that your sugar projects are a couple of years ago, um, roughly four or five or even six years ago. Uh, one of the things that we would be very interested in learning, so what, when exactly, what was your sugar project and uh, what was it about and who did you collaborate with? Whoever wants to start. I'll go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> So my project was 2014, 2015. At the time I was a des design student at Javeriana University. And we were actually working with the university itself as a company. So they were our sponsored and we were partnering up with the IITK Indian Institute of Technology in Kampur. And the challenge we had was to design and create 
spaces for students when they were not in class. So in Colombia, there's this kind of trend that you spend all your day in university and there's not a lot of space to be in, like if you don't have class and you would normally find students just like sitting around on the floor, like studying or sleeping. And that was the problem we basically had to tackle. Did you do these amazing furnitures at this time? Yes. Was... yes. Yes, we were actually at the end, the solution was like two, two systems that were furniture based. One was more like a chair and the other one was like a modular kind of sitting area for friends. Okay, I like them. I remember the, the final... I remember them. Yeah, I still remember them. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> okay, so Felix or uh, Bernardo, what was your project and when was it? Okay, I'll go. Um, so I was one year before Juliana and um, I worked with the Valeo team. Uh, so Valeo is a French car part manufacturer and their challenge was to invent what it was like to be in an autonomous car and especially during traffic jam situations. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up inventing some kind of multi-sensorial experience to access your uh, digital life. So mostly the content of your apps, uh, social media platforms, and more generally uh, medias uh, from your dashboard uh, with the kind of hit that you, you had to be able to take back control anytime like in less than say five seconds. So um, the solution was to make a way to interact with the content while uh, keeping a driving uh, position. So you, with the hands on the wheel and uh, the look as close as possible uh, to the road uh, while maintaining a good experience of, for example, watching a movie and answering a text and so on. It's extremely interesting. Do you mind if I ask you, uh, do you know from the beginning of the project, what was the time frame? Like when, when was this solution part of a, of a system of a car? So um, we started with the expectation that this kind of car would be market ready by um, 2020. So it should have been on the market today. Obviously, those expectations were a little bit high compared to the real technological readiness of like, the technical part, like sensors and artificial intelligence that would make this possible. Uh, we see today that uh, maybe only a, a couple manufacturer enabled uh, level three autonomous driving. I think Tesla and maybe uh, Audi uh, start just like rolling this out, but it's still like really early on. So. Um, so this innovation or this kind of innovations are not yet fully ready to be on the market. Today. Yeah. I remember roughly at the same time, we had a challenge with a company on autonomous driving, uh, like a foresight challenge. And when we, uh, you know, the kind of scenarios that the students build for in five to 10 years, which would be now, I mean, they're still futuristic today. <laughs> so, time is moving slower in this regard as we might sometimes think. But I think what's funny is that the futurist, futuristic part has narrowed down a little bit because mm -hmm. at the time, the, the, the autonomous driving part was futuristic, but so was the uh, interact from your car parts. And what's funny is that we've observed that in the, in the meantime, all the interactions that we had imagined have rolled out uh, in production in some degraded way, but really exist in cars today, like, uh, for example, Apple CarPlay and similar mm. technologies enable you to access uh, the content of your devices on your car, which is something that was still futuristic in back in 2013. Mm -hmm. So Bernardo, now we are curious what kind of project you did. So I was one year later from Juliana um, and I worked uh, I was in University of Sao Paulo here in Brazil, working with the Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland. And the sponsor was the Trinity College robotic, uh, let's say area inside the, 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 the university. And the project was to design the next generation of 
let's say, user interface between humans and robots. Uh, it was really, really interesting, but really hard as well. It was, uh, we had to understand uh, in what area this kind of interface that we were trying to design was to, was going to be applied. So there are many, many options in robotics. So are you going to help the elderly? Are you going to help, for example, a store, uh, uh, a restaurant? So uh, we, we went through uh, trying to understand in what area we would apply this robot, but also trying to understand how humans perceive emotions, which was the best part of it, because we decided to focus on the elderly. And because of that, we wanted to make a really user centric, easy to interact with interface. Mm -hmm. And that went into studying a lot how we perceive and how we we show our emotions. Yeah. Was this a project that you, oh, sorry. Yeah. What? Uh, no, I was just uh, curious. Uh, go ahead, ask, ask uh, Bernardo a question. I'm more curious to, to a follow up. Uh, so go ahead. Okay. Now, uh, Bernardo, was this the project that ended up in a uh, science uh, paper and a cover of the science magazine? Exactly. I was really wow. amazed when I saw in Time magazine. It was on the cover of Time magazine. The Time magazine. magazine. Yeah. I guess uh, that was perfectly good as a segue for my question, which was Do you know what happened to your project after you yes. finished it? And today? Yes. Uh, uh, of course, I don't know the details because the professor Connor McGregor, I think is the surname. Uh, I remember quite well Connor. Um, it was the the initial part, let's say, of his postdoc studies. So he continued with the work, and this robot became quite famous, especially in Ireland. Today, it applies in well, in in many many um, concepts within their their design, but. Yeah, uh, it was. I was really happy when I saw Tem Time magazine talking about a robot that will help the elderly. So for all the students who are uh, part of the program this year, so this, this is kind of a, a very high level of achievement. That's probably the max you can reach here in this setup. <laughs> anyway, but you know, no pressure for sure, no pressure. <laughs> uh, so I would like to do a very quick round to all the three of you. I would like to. Um, like you to state in probably one sentence, what is, you know, with looking back on your project from four, five, six, or seven years ago, um, what is the one key takeaway that you still, you know, it took away or you still remember? So what is the most important element that you took away for your life or your professional life? That's a hard one. Yeah, that's a challenging one. Like there's so many things, but I, I think that to me, what sparks the most, it's, it's learning to deal and to work with different perceptions. So when you have a, like the value of a multidisciplinary team for me was key. Um, like we were in my team, at least I was the designer and most of my team was engineering based. So the perceptions to whatever problem we were looking at were very different. And we had cultural differences, gender differences, so many things that that made the project so much richer. So now I feel like I'm always trying to look for someone who thinks differently to the way I think that will contribute so much more. Uh, the embracing diversity. Yes, exactly. <laughs> awesome. So that gave Bernardo and Felix a bit of time. So we were curious to hear your takeaways. Okay, I, I think the most important thing for me was um, how, how full of assumptions we are at the beginning of a project and, and to, um, to be aware of those assumptions and to challenge them through just speaking with a lot of people. So the rest of your team, and especially when they are from different backgrounds is important, but uh, I guess most of those assumptions can be changed just by speaking with people from outside your organization, especially end users. And that has become something like, you know, uh, gymnastic, like something that you have to practice and practice and practice. And it becomes second nature to every day um, think about like, what do I think about this project 
uh, that might be completely wrong and who can I ask for this information or how can I ask users in a way that will not give me biased answers? Perfect. Um, mine, I would say <laughs> it's a bit of, of what they both already said. Um, I come from an engineering background, right? And I was, I, I studied mechanical engineer. And when I went into my sugar project, I realized that uh, <clears throat> not everything is like what we think is like when you study engineer. So calculations and, and designing everything already with my hypothesis well made, and then I can start calculating everything. So when I got into this project, working with designers, working with people who had a business background, I realized that there's more a human touch to it. So how can I go into the field and ask some questions uh, and interview and experience uh, an elderly home? That, that's what we did. And with that, you try to understand how you're going to apply into the mechanical engineering part of the robot. So it, it was really hard. It, it was really interesting. But this this diversity of way of thinking and understanding that designing something is not only calculating and, and uh, uh, constructing your hypothesis and, and doing the calculus part of it uh, was really, really interesting. And to be really honest, and cha it changed, but I think we'll talk a bit later, but it, it changed what I thought about what it was engineering and what I did later on. Oh. I guess that if I can follow up that question with something that also, I think quite a lot as a, as a, as a past student is, uh, what would be one thing, uh, could be about the experience or also could be about the result that you would definitely not change whatsoever about your sugar project. And one thing that you would definitely do different, something that you think that maybe now knowing more, I would change. You can think for it. <laughs> you can think of it. I, I think I, hard one. <laughs> I can start. Um, one thing that I wouldn't change is uh, Connor had a really strong, the professor had a really strong mechanical engineering. It, it was his major, it was his doctorate. Um, so what I did was I got together with the de more des the design team because we already had a robot with the mechanical part of it really well thought. Uh, and we were trying to understand how uh, the emotions would be designed. This was the main part of the project. So uh, shifting a bit and say, okay, I, I know I'm a mechanical engineer, but let's go together with the design part of the team and, and work with them and, and see how they work was, was really amazing. Um, and what I would, ch uh, would change, this is hard. I, I, I wouldn't say the 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 project itself but i would say maybe i i, I uh, would do design university instead of engineering university <laughs> okay i for me it's an easy one uh well i can say that now that i had time to think about it but uh, um so the thing that i would never change is um the approach we had as a team and our team dynamics and i think i I was lucky to, to end up with wonderful uh, partners in my team and people I'm still very close to today and people that are very dear to me uh, come from, from this year uh, in the Sugar Network and, and probably some of my best friends are from this team. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful for, for this and it's something I really don't want to change in my life. But uh, one thing though I would change completely is um, I didn't have my driving license at the time. Um, I still don't have it today. As a car designer, it it's, might sound shocking. And uh, um, I realized that a, a smart move at the time would have been to enroll for driving lessons. I mean, I'm doing it, I, I started taking driving lessons uh, this year after uh, leaving the car industry. And I realized I learned so many things about the experience of driving as a car, uh, like, like as a driving 
uh, students. And I, I, I think I missed out on this experience back in the days. And I, okay. I, failed, to, I failed to make the connection bef between the, the work and my private life uh, while it could have enriched both so much more. Yeah, really. Um, so this, you must, be, must have been really good and um, empathizing because uh, you know, working for the, in the car industry for such a long time and then without driving a car yourself, um, that actually shows the quality, I would say. So uh, the, the way I, I see it is I'm very good at being a passenger. And when you're in an autonomous car, everybody is a passenger, including the driver. Yeah, point. Yeah, point. <laughs> cool. Shall we move on, Juan? I think we got Juliana still for answers. Oh, you got, yeah. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> so something I would change was that we didn't get a chance to meet all of our partner team from the Indian Institute of Technology. And I wish we would have had time to sit down together, meet each other, and also work together in the same space. Um, and something I will not change, I think are those heated moments between the team that you have like arguments um, because something positive always comes out of that. And I think those had the biggest learning curves. Mm -hmm. So maybe at the time I didn't want them, but now I, I think they were good. Yeah. I think yeah. that, that's a good bridge. We had some interesting comments in the chat where also Robert, for example, shared that these deep issues in the team were a few obstacles, but uh, knowing, I think you guys were able to overcome them as well. And probably looking back now, you might have a, a similar look at the issue like Juliana. I see you, <laughs> maybe that's an agreement. <laughs> yeah, it takes a little bit of time, but, but yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, also please feel free to, to use our chat or join us here, unmute yourself and ask questions. I know um, I see a few here who are current students or also I know Mirko Noor, you are uh, past students. If you have something to add, please. Uh, we have our three panelists, but we're also interested and in the others to hear, hear yours. Am, Maybe am I allowed to say something about the team issues? <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, the the issues are what drives um, the design thinking process, because if everyone has the same uh, mind and the same mindset, the same idea about everything, then there's basically no room for innovation. Um, what I wrote is that there are sometimes deep issues or like some team setups just don't work. Um, and then there are some trust breaks or even kind of like things that go close to malevolence in a way where some parts of the team don't want the other parts of the team to succeed. And um, this is something what I learned in a way is that it's really important. I mean, the, you can you can work with a lot of differences, but some differences you really cannot work with. And if you have these, and if you don't mind these when setting up a team, when building the team, then you set up basically your project for failure because there's no way you can surmount this. Um, on the other hand, you do want some uh, differences. You do want some issues, so you can work. So there's this, um, I think this is a typical thing in design thinking where you want some of it, but not over everything. Some chaos, but not too much. Some structure, but not too much, and so forth. Yeah, and and uh, to that, I think that one one point that I, I personally firmly believe is it's I have the same relationship that Felix has in uh, with uh, past uh, people from project. They are my dearest friends, and I still we still talk all the time, and and we're really really good friends. And I think that one thing that is really really important is to establish that very good relationship in between the team to make the effort to very, very much be not only teammates that see each other from nine to five, but rather can become friends. Because I think that that allows also for an honest discussion and, and, and where you can say things that are a little bit more frank and a little bit much more harsh, but from a place of, 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 of trust in each other and, and, and not just in we hate each other kind of way, uh, which I think that uh, Juliana and her team took <laughs> the advice when I gave it to them back in the day. So now we talked a lot about uh, your sugar experience, uh, your learnings that you took away. What I would be curious about is now, what are you doing today? I mean, that's four, five, six, seven years ago, and uh, you have a professional license. So what are you doing today? Whoever wants to get started. Should I start? Sure. Okay. Yeah, good. Uh, 
Uh, I work in a startup called Brazilian startup called ID Wall. Uh, what we do is we automate the onboarding process. So you guys are from Europe. You might have heard Jumio on on Fido. Uh, these are companies that. Uh, what we do is how can I be sure that Bernardo is, for example, opening this bank account in a digital way, in a technological way, since I'm not meeting Bernardo and checking his document. Uh, in Brazil, that is quite complicated since we have more than 1,500 national documents formats. It's a bit disorganized. Uh, myself, I can have 27 different national documents, one from each state. So even the government doesn't really know how to check your ID. Uh, so we do this through technological, uh, uh, technological solution. And what I do inside IDWall is I work inside the product team, uh, but I'm not specifically in one squad. Uh, I work as a business, product business developer. W what does this mean? It was my first question when I went to the interview. <laughs> and uh, the idea is the fraud market is a, it's, it's really complicated. We, we are not able to overcome fraud with only our solution. So the idea here is how we manage to create an open innovation environment inside our product team. And we are able to partner with different solutions that might attack different use cases, but together with our platform will make sense to our clients. So my, my job role is to kind of understand our gaps and within our gaps, how, how I might do some open innovation and work with other startups in order to integrate our products and go to market together. Do you still use any kind of design thinking approaches in this context? Definitely, definitely. We we are. Well, I think the I always think this is a cliche, but it, it's it's because we work with that. But we are constantly talking with our client, understanding their needs. We are creating. We are constantly doing some testings with the the ideas that comes from clients together with our partners, and and before integrating and and building a strategy together with the, with the partner you're going to market. We are constantly doing some MVPs and, and trying to understand how we will first have a really strong uh, connection between the products that we are comfortable with, with that our clients are comfortable with. And then we, we I'll, I'll, let's say, leave the project to the squad, the product squad that will eventually integrate it fully and put it into market. Cool. What, uh, Juliana, how about you? So after Sugar Project, I moved to the UK and I went ahead and studied a little bit more. I did a master's in communication for design. And then I started working for a Finnish digital agency called Luxus Worldwide. I still work for them. I am a user experience designer. And what I normally do is I, I focus on clients that need digital transformation. So I try to help companies adopt more of a user centric design approach to whatever problems they're having. So of course it's basically design thinking. Um, currently I'm working as a consultant for the IKEA global team in Sweden. Um, so I've been helping them go through their digital transformation, implement a new design system. And I'm right now focusing on iterating and working on the product pages of IKEA. Cool. Uh, one final question on the follow-up and Juan, then you take over. Um, Juan, uh, Juliana, what you, you started with a sugar project, let's say about, you know, students on campus using furniture and these kind of things and now you're um, um, a UX designer you are in digital transformation digital services is there any big difference that you spot between let's say designing furniture for students and uh, designing um, digital services well I mean on, on the actual final product of course um, I do not have an industrial design background so I actually didn't know how to design furniture. So that's something I actually learned through the sugar problem solving techniques. Um, but I think you can, you can use the same approach to anything. It doesn't matter if it's a digital product, if it's a physical I, product, or it, it's basically the way you 
kind of think and solve issues. Um, I'm more focused on kind of finding problems, so all the need finding and seeing what our users need and then what's the best solution visually for them through a digital product. And I guess we're missing Felix. No, he's there. Yeah, he's no, I mean for answering. <laughs> Sorry. I swear I didn't try to escape the question. Uh, I simply have a bad internet connection here. So sorry, sorry about that. So um, to answer the question, I now work in a startup called Greenback. And uh, our mission is to save the world's soil. And may, many of you might be interested in um, environmental issues, global warming. And one of the not so well-known issues of, uh, of the world is that our soils are declining um, because of the uh, agricultural practices, uh, destruction of forests, uh, uh, chemical inputs, and so on. And just like water or oil, uh, the soil is a finite resource. And, and we are quickly losing it. And uh, so the goal of the startup is to create a global agency to rate the ecological uh, health of soils uh, in order to change the mindset about the soil, to stop thinking about it as just like, you know, the, a platform for the plant to grow or for the, uh, for the, the, the animals to feed, but as our uh, a dear uh, richness that we have and something that we need to an asset that we need to to save and to protect so we are creating a rating agency uh, just like maybe um, uh, economical or financial rating agency that will give grades to soils based on their health so that it creates a preference for products that come from soils that are well managed so who would you be your client? So who's paying for you? So it can be any actor of the agriculture industry. It can be either, uh, for example, um, farmers or farmer unions that want to monitor the, their ecological transition. It can be government uh, that want to monitor the impact of their regulations or that want to, uh, to give subsidies that, uh, that uh, uh, help uh, farmers change their practice or that uh, that gives a positive reinforcement to good practices and it can be for example bankers or insurance company that want to make sure they invest in the in assets that will not get destroyed in the future so <clears throat> well that's just one in many use cases but really everybody it, it's a story that involves everybody uh, because we all need to eat and everything we eat comes from the soil Definitely. Uh, then I guess the, the, the next question that I would have for you guys is knowing what you know, having been through the process yourselves, also been now working in, in different companies and in different things where you still apply some of the elements of design thinking and, and you still use uh, some of these things, what advice would you give to, to, to the current students and in, in terms of what to focus on or pay attention or be more mindful of in their, in their process? I would say test as early as possible and don't be afraid to fail. Um, so something maybe because of my background, I struggled a lot during the process was getting a quick and dirty prototype in front of users. Like I, I wanted it to be as perfect as possible. And that's a problem. Um, you, you don't want that. Um, you want it as quickly as possible in the market and then you wanna iterate on that and fix whatever is not working. And, and that's the way it also works in the real world. Um, so I had to learn the hard way. Um, and now I'm not afraid to fail. Like if it doesn't work, that's okay, you fix it. Like there, it's not a problem. And I don't think we're brought up with the idea that failing is okay. And we should be doing that. That's how we're gonna learn. Um, so kind of, I would say, be mindful about that. So um, today I uh, design uh, for Greenback, I designed the platform that enable 
operators on the field to perform the sampling that we need to uh, rate the soil, but I also designed a platform that gives the results uh, of the tests to the people who need it. So it's basically, it's mostly data visualization. And so it's mostly UX and UI. And uh, I work very closely with farmers and scientists and people who really need to use this data. And I could not do 5% of what I do today without them because I know nothing about agriculture. I've been working in the automotive industry for seven years. Before that, I was a student in automotive design and I know nothing about agriculture. And if I was not working with uh, farmers every day, I would be completely lost and none, nothing in my design would make sense. Um, so yeah, I, I think like getting the right people to collaborate with you and to help you is really the, the, the key element uh, of the success of, of my project so far. Adding up with uh, with what Juliana said, I think we, we need to test it fast and we need to test it cheap. Uh, uh, it's it's really hard for, at least for me, who, who came from a technological background to, to understand that you can try things uh, really easily and design brings the idea of this design thinking in general uh, and it's hard uh, uh, sometimes we know too much technology and we understand that the, a specifically technology such as for example uh, AI uh, will be able to help us out but this means that um, uh, you're gonna to you're gonna have to spend much also uh, for and I still do that wrongly sometimes today so it's okay to to get it wrong. Uh, I'd like to say an example. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking with the CEO because we were partnering with uh, an AI startup to do one thing. Uh, but the project itself would be uh, more or less like 100,000 euros. And the CEO looked at me and said, look, we, we are discovering this partnership right now. I'm not getting into the details of the project, but I think we can solve this and test this through a Google Forms, no? So why would we spend a, a thousand? Uh, 100,000 uh, reais, which is more like 50, 30,000 euros for right now. Uh, so it, and the problem was I was thinking ahead. I knew AI would help us. Uh, I knew that the project will, will succeed, would be able to succeed within this hypothesis that we were doing. Uh, but I wasn't thinking cheap, like, okay, but I, I want, I don't want to spend to, to, that much to check on my hypothesis. So test it fast and test it cheap and uh, don't feel afraid uh, of, of, like Juliana said, of getting it wrong. Like until today I was like, yeah, let's do this project. And the guy was like, no, like you're completely wrong. We are not gonna spend that money. And then I, I well, I, <laughs> I, I've realized that we, we, we needed to go cheaper. Mm -hmm. I, I can totally empathize uh, with this situation. And uh, I'd like to, to bounce on both Juliana and Bernardo and what they just say, because I think there is a right and a wrong way to quick and dirty prototype. And I think I, I've done the mistakes also many times to just rely too much on, you know, the, the image that you have of quick and dirty prototype that you have, that you associate with any free time, for example, uh, using cardboard, uh, like, uh, you know, the, the paperback challenge and stuff like this. So doing things that, uh, that look a little bit like toys, that look a little bit clumsy. And I think I, it's easy to mistake the aesthetic of it uh, for the, its function. And the function is always to experiment at low cost and quickly. Uh, and sometimes you can just think, okay, I need to test something quickly. So I do something very quickly with cardboard, etc. So I've done, for example, uh, car interfaces or even entire dashboard out of cardboard, and I learned nothing. And the reason why I learned nothing is because the, the thing I was trying to, to learn was not clear in my head. And so people arrived in front of this dashboard and it, it was so far away from what they could expect from a dashboard or a car that they were too distracted by the aesthetic of the prototype to give me insightful answers. So I think there's some balance to find between quick and dirty and the right amount of realistic that will uh, trigger the right kind of conversation that you want to have with your testers or users. Cool, thank you. 
I would like to, if this is okay for you, I would like to start opening up the floor a little bit and encourage people from you know, um, all other um, members on the, the, the group, um, no matter if you're teaching team, if you're alumni, if you're current students, to also you know, share your impressions, raise your questions. And maybe as a starting point, um, we have two comments that I can just see also in terms of experiences and values that you took away from the project from Nur and Afnan. Uh, you, you, you sent them into the chat, but would you feel comfortable to share your impression live with us? Of course. Uh, well, hi everyone, it's a pleasure. So I'm Noor and I was participating two years ago uh, in the Sugar um, together with uh, the Trinity College of Dublin. And uh, what I was saying before in the chat is that actually it is really important not to be afraid of asking help to someone or even to just ask an opinion about something to people that we do not know. Uh, so sometimes I talk for personal experience, at least for us, it was really hard sometimes to really understand in which direction to go when we were in really divergent phases. And it was really hard to actually um, say, okay, this route is not really the one that we have to follow uh, or at least to eliminate some options. So what we did at that point was to really ask everyone but really everyone, even uh, I, I can remember at that period, we asked to former, uh, former sugar students uh, some opinions about our project or to even professors at our university that were not really connected to the sugar project. We asked everyone. And actually this is something really important because most of the times, when you present yourself to someone, even to a business and you say that you're a student, they are welcoming you in, a, in such a, a really nice way because, come on, how can they say, you know, I'm not here ready to listen to you because you're a student, you're trying to do everything you can to find an innovative solution or to help someone. Of course, it changes according to the, um, to the challenge, but still, you're there, you're a student, you're so fresh, you have such a smiling face, so why not trying to help you? Cool. Afna, do you want to follow up on this? Yeah, yeah, sure, definitely. Um, well, I, I tot totally agree with what Noor said about about you know being a student and you know uh, utilizing that card uh, as much as you can when you actually can use it. And there's no no harm in that. And everybody is open to you know helping out, uh, be it uh, the corporate partners, be it uh, alumni, or be it the teaching team. But uh, one thing that I remember, so uh, my project was a couple of years ago, 2018, 19. Uh, I was uh, part of the Alto team and we were collaborating with the team from China, uh, University of Science and Technology. And there was a big, um, of course, I am from, from Asia, but not everyone was in our team. And there was a, a big cultural difference. Uh, and that was one of the things that we struggled with a lot uh, during, during, during the project. But that was also what, what was the biggest learning for me. And, uh, I have reflected on this multiple times in, in interviews and also in di different discussions that uh, uh, being able to understand where the other person is coming from, that's the, the biggest thing. You know, if you can learn to do that, uh, I think you can, you can tackle any, any kind of teamwork that you are, you are you know, involved in. And uh, that was my biggest takeaway from the Sugar Project because working with, with a, a very diverse team for nine months is, is not easy. And um, uh, it was, it was uh, uh, I would say in the end, it was definitely worth it. <laughs> cool. Thank you very much for sharing this. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Um, I would, uh, as I said, I'm welcoming any kind of questions to the audience, any kind of comments here to give you a few seconds to just, you know, think about what you could contribute or what you can ask. I, I want to point your attention to the mural board that we also prepared in peril. So if you have anything to add to any kind of wishes, any kind of likes and, um, it's for the Sugar Bar event, events, please feel free to either post them here in the comments or even better, post them on our mural board. Because um, you know, our ambition with this Sugar Bar is to reconnect people who haven't been with us uh, for a few months, as well, a few years as we already saw, or connect the alumni with the current students, uh, the current alumni with the current teaching teams, and so forth to maintain our network a little bit better. 
So uh, any kind of suggestions, comments are welcome. So please in the comments or even better in the, on the mirror board. So now you had a few seconds to uh, think what you could probably contribute or ask to our guests. Um, any, anybody who wants to speak up? Everybody's so shy. I, I, Otherwise, maybe we add some one-on-one -on -one time. How do you feel about it? That could be also something that uh, we um, practiced, uh, I think for the first time at Expo, Maya, is that correct? Yeah. yeah. So what we did is we did some random matching. So this means uh, it's like, you know, speed dating. Maya will set up uh, several um, breakout rooms and then we assign PU to other people randomly. Is this, uh, Maya, how we do it? Yes. Um, so, um, well, this is now our, as Neil said, our random networking. Before we move there, um, of course, if you are now needing to leave, then it's free for you. So before you leave, we have our next sugar bar coming up in February, 18th of February. So if you want to mark your calendar, please do so. And don't forget to put on mirror board anything you are looking into. If it's another talk with a former alumni, if you rather would like to do some ice breaking activity with former alumni, or we also thought of uh, actually inviting an artist who kind of breaks the, the usual. Um, uh, so yeah, please make use of the mirror board or post it, uh, get in touch with me and we're happy to, to bring this um, project forward with your help. And yeah, you are our, um, how do you call it, um, personas. So we need to <laughs> put you into the middle of our, our design. <laughs>